Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. I'm Virginia Stanley from Library Love Fest, Harper Library Marketing Team. I'm here with my cohorts. Hello, cohorts. Hello, cohorts. <laughs> I'm Chris. Hi. Hello. And Lainey. And we have two really special guests with us today. Uh, we're going to um, split this hour and a half and talk a little bit to each author. We are thrilled to have best-selling author, uh, acclaimed writer, Jonathan Latham with us today, author of Motherless Brooklyn, The Feral Detective, uh, among others. And he's got a new book coming out in November. It's never too soon to talk about books. And so we're gonna talk with Jonathan about his book, The Arrest. Hello, Jonathan. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. And Diane Cook, uh, your book, your collection of short stories, Man v. Nature, acclaimed, beloved, and now you have your debut novel coming out in a week, a week from today. Yeah. Yes, uh, and The New Wilderness, and we are so excited to talk to you about this. Congratulations, the accolades are pouring in and the starred reviews and long listed for the Booker Prize. We have so much to talk about with both of you. And so thank you both for coming and taking time to speak with us and speak with our librarian pals about your books. And uh, so we're just gonna take, have a visit. Yes, Jonathan, we'll have a visit. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to you to say whatever you wanna say and then we'll get our conversation underway. So Jonathan, okay. Diane. Well yeah, thanks so much for having us. Um, it's really great to get a, a chance to to visit and and get it also a window into how you you switched things over into your virtual realm here, um, the Zoom life that's overtaken us all. And um, I'm really excited to meet Diane too this way, and can't wait to read your book. Congratulations, uh, the, the Booker nomination. What a what a fantastic way to launch. I yes, it was quite a shock very happy about it a nice shock pleasant shock um yeah it's been it's been very fun and great to do this i've watched different um things that you've put together the library love fest and you still wanted to come on yeah <laughs> yeah i like books <laughs> um so this is a real treat for me also i i you know we've all been in lockdown and my husband and i have been pretty serious about it because I was pregnant for the first part of lockdown and now I have a two month old. So it's just nice to see people and talk to people <laughs> who aren't in my walls between you know my four walls. So this is nice. And nice to meet you, Jonathan. Um, I get I bet you get this a lot, but I I used to live in Borum Hill on Dean Street. <laughs> oh no, you must have been so annoyed at how many people asked you whether you'd read The Fortress of Solitude. <laughs> no, but, I mean, I read it, I loved it, but you must be annoyed at how many people tell you what's, you know, what their address was on Dean Street when you meet them. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's means so much to me that, um, that I became so super identified with the block I grew up on. And, and, and then it became really a place where lots and lots of people I would meet later in my life would, would would move to so it's sort of this endless uh, kind of Dean Street you know the, the club is very big let's put it yeah. that way <laughs> yeah, definitely. that's great well there's um yeah there's 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 so much to talk about um and I know that we could we could probably just stay here and Chris and Laney and I could actually turn our cameras off and leave you two at it but um but we'll uh we'll we'll come back at the end together to say our, our final thoughts on things. Uh, but for now, Jonathan, I think what we'll do is um, say goodbye. A little Don't go too time far. I'm out. I'll take a little time out. I'll think it over <laughs> in the other room. <laughs> okay. okay. See you in a have bit. Fun. See you have fun, soon. Diana. I'll see you at the, at the back end of it. <laughs> Bye, guys. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, can we hear you okay? Can we hear Diane okay? Uh, yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah, 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 clear, you're Diane. good, you're good. So Diane, yes. my goodness. Um, your book has exploded and it's not even on sale yet. Yes, 
so much to talk about about this book. This book is epic. This book is a journey. Um, and it's not, it's in a way, it's sort of easy to explain what it's about, but it, but in reading it, it takes, there are so many layers to this book. There are so many aspects to the book. I'm going to turn it to you um, and ask you to just tell viewers um, whatever you want them to know about the book. Okay. Yeah, you're right. It, there's like a lot of aspects to it, but the thing that I used to say long ago when I was writing it and I didn't want to talk about it, um, kind of my, I guess maybe it would, you would call it an elevator pitch. I would just say that it's, I'm writing a book or I wrote a book um, and it's about the last wilderness area um, in existence and the group of people who calls it home. That's kind of how I would describe it, um, which, you know, is like technically true, <laughs> but there's a lot more to it. Um, the book, The New Wilderness, like takes place in the future. Um, and it's a place where in the future, most people live in like an overcrowded metropolis, the city, and every other landscape and every other, all other land is being used for things to prop up that population. So like all the land is used for um, farming or mining or like lumber or manufacturing or, you know, housing of garbage. And the country is just not, um, this free open landscape anymore. Um, there's, but there's one last wilderness area, one last wild place, one last nature place left and it's called the wilderness state. And so in my book, a group of people gets chosen to be kind of guinea pigs um, in an experiment to see if people and nature can coexist anymore because it's been so long since they have. Um, and so my book imagines that group of people wandering this wilderness area, like, like prehistoric, um, primitive hunter gatherers. Um, they don't have dwellings. They don't have farms. They just have to gather what they can and hunt and live and walk. Um, it's kind of a very walking filled book. But, <laughs> um, but a lot happens and the novel really focuses mostly on the relationship between two of the people who are in that group. Um, it's a mother bee and her daughter Agnes. And they've ended up in the wilderness state because Agnes has, was really sick and probably going to die if she stayed in the city. The city's very polluted and a lot of children especially um, have uh, breathing problems and end up, it's just not a great life. It's not a good place. Um, there's a lot of risk in the city. So they end up going to the wilderness state and it's kind of about their journey and their relationship as they grow up, as Agnes grows up and becomes like a very different person than she might have become in the city because she's in this totally new landscape. Um, and it's kind of, I guess, kind of a metaphor for, uh, or an example of like how all, I don't know, mothers and daughters and maybe parents and children have to kind of, parents have to raise their children to be people who don't need them anymore. So you're raising kids to become something separate from yourself and the book kind of explores that in a very literal way. That's what I would say about it. <laughs> That's a great way to wrap it. I realized that I didn't share the cover, so I'm putting that up right now. There's the cover. It's a gorgeous cover. Um, and I wanted to, you know, read just a small little quote that came in. <laughs> I was looking at Goodreads, you know, and Roxane Gay, five out of five stars, this gripping, fierce, terrifying examination of what people are capable of when they want to survive in both the best and worst 
ways. Loved this. That's an amazing quote. Yeah, yeah I was really um, happy to see that. She's such a wonderful reader and person and in the community. So I was very excited. You, uh, as I was saying before, in addition to, oh, just that little thing being long listed for the Booker Prize. That, <laughs> God. No. <laughs> um, that um, you've received starred reviews uh, from Publishers Weekly and Kirkus. I love this review from Publishers Weekly that says, in this wry speculative debut novel, Cook envisions a crowded and polluted near future in which only one natural area remains, the wilderness state. Cook's unsettling, darkly humorous tale explores maternal love and man's disdain for nature with impressive results. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to give away too much, but I, um, I, can we talk about Agnes for a hot second? Yeah. Agnes is so tuned into animals and to, and to, into nature. Like she, she just becomes uh, one with them. I mean, Am I right? Is it, yeah. she just, uh, I don't know, she sort of flourishes in this place where she is kind of like her, her, you know, she seems to have sort of a snippets of a memory of uh, her previous life before being brought here to, to get healthy. And then she suddenly just becomes very attuned to um, the nature and- yeah. yeah, she, so Agnes is the daughter and, and she arrives in the wilderness state as a, like a kid without, you know, she, she's just at the stage where she's forming memories. I, you know, I have like dreamy memories of my life when I was around four or five and that's about the age that she is. Um, it's like an age where you get snippets but not, not a real sense of the reality of your former, of that, your life at that point. Um, so when she arrives in the wilderness state, she is like the sponge um, and the the culture that is there or you know the reality of that space becomes the only reality she really ever knows um i liken her to like a native speaker um mm. where she just it just uh it's not so much that she learns about the wilderness state but she just becomes part of it um, and then I think of her mother as like the person struggling to always learn that language and always kind of a few steps behind and, and getting things wrong all the time. So yeah, she is, she's just, she's just a part of it. And that's kind of the, the beauty of her is that she's this pure, pure thing in this, in this place, um, this place that saved her life. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you feel about uh, the comparison to uh, Lord of the Flies? Um, is there a comparison to Lord of the Flies? Are you comparing it to Lord of the Flies? I am not. I saw that written somewhere and oh. I thought, oh, that's, that sort of rings, it rang true for me. Uh -huh. You know, just sort of the survivalist and how they all sort of yeah. You know, you've got this new society society of people who have to try and figure it out. And there's all this sort of hierarchy and struggle for, you know, who's going to take the lead. But we all have to know how to do a little bit of everything just in case something happens to one of us. And I don't know, it's, it, it rang true for me. So I wanted to know what you thought. No, that makes sense to me. I Well, the Lord of the Flies thing has also been um, used to talk about some of the stories in my story collection um mm -hmm. specifically there's one in there where it's like an actual group of little boys running around in the woods trying trying to survive um so uh yeah that makes a lot of sense to me i also get kafka-esque a lot <laughs> which i'm absolutely not complaining about it's a great thing to be called um and yeah but there's like there's definitely this and I think especially as the novel goes on without giving anything away, like the, the hierarchies, the struggles for power, um, even in this small group of people um, is ramps up as they go on. And yeah, it's a wild, it's, 
it's a wild situation and it's really pressing upon humans to the point where they become their animal selves. And that's something that I am very interested in and love exploring in my writing. It's just endlessly fascinating to me that we are animals and that there's the spectrum that we're on and we're like farther this way, we're more human, but we're all, everything's on a spectrum. And I just think exploring that is so endlessly fascinating. I also found it interesting that, um, and I, I, I don't think I'm giving any, anything away, but when, because there, there are a bunch of people, you know, there's, a, there's this group and inevitably because they have to keep moving and, and, and foraging and, and surviving and figuring it all out. There are some who, there will be a person here or there that won't survive. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of taken by <laughs> the fact that they were, it was became sort of matter of fact in a way, you know, almost the way I suppose, I don't know, would that be the way it would be in the animal kingdom? It was like, oh, that's too bad, but that good, that good rope went with that person and we needed that rope. Like, you know, it just, it's just, like it just changes. It just, people just change and they evolve and they are going to do everything they can to survive. It's, it's, it's endlessly fascinating. It is such an epic journey. And I, I'm just immersed in this book. I just find it, um, and I'm obviously not alone. Uh, you've got, we, we are both, all three of us are big fans of the book. And I don't, again, I don't want to say too much, but I can't stop talking about how great it is. Thank you so much. I'm really glad you like it. Chris Laney, I'll turn it over to you because I'm going to, Diane's probably like, stop talking. Don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, Diane, I'm just curious about your nature writing because I think it's easy to over romanticize nature in a way. And especially if you have this book where, you know, it's the last, you know, it's this last, it's the last wilderness. And like the, seeing it through the character's eyes, similar to like what Virginia was saying, it's so matter of fact, and there is beauty there. Could you, but could you talk about how you came to writing about nature and how you would kind of avoid that over sentimentalizing it and, and you know, over romanticizing it almost? Yeah, I mean, I think part of the reason I write about it is because I also very, can very easily fall into that, that, um, pattern of just like waxing poetic about the beauty of nature and the natural world, especially uh, American landscapes and the American West um, is like a very complicated and uh, problematic landscape. So um, I want to like, I, I always want to push back against uh, just the dream, the dreamscape and remember that it's like a very real landscape um, and, a, and has a very uh, troubled past. Um, but also I, I am, um, and I used to teach at this literature program called the New England Literature Program, which maybe we'll talk about later. Um, and one of the things that we would often talk about is the idea of wilderness and what it, that is. Um, and there's a lot of writing about this, this idea of um, what a wild space is and what an uh, untouched space is, because that's, I mean, that doesn't actually make much sense that some place could be pristine and untouched and you would be there looking at it. <laughs> um, and then untouched by who and at what point? Um, so I find those, I find those kinds of questions really interesting. Um, this is like the intellectual part of me. Um, so when I look out on a landscape and I think about wanting to write about nature, I want it to be complicated and not necessarily just pretty, even though I can look at it and say, oh my gosh, this is so pretty. Um, but I want it to be what it really is. I want it to be complex and um, complicated, just like I want my characters to be complex and complicated. Um, and I think maybe in that way, the natural world when I'm writing about it becomes another character. Um, I just want it to be true. I thought it did. It just, it felt like a seamless part and player within the story. And I, yeah, I absolutely loved it. 
Um, and I'm curious because I, I want to talk about Agnes and B's relationship a little bit more because I love the push pull there. And I'm reminded of this section when Agnes is talking about having issues, thinking about what it is to have a child and what time, you know, what point in their life you let them roam free. And I think she said like oh, five or six, <laughs> just so big like that. Um, but could you talk about writing that relationship? Because it feels antagonistic at times. I mean, it feels like the book itself, very genuine. Yeah, I think it's just like mothers and daughters are, it's this like elemental prickly relationship. I mean, I, I would love, I love hearing that mothers and daughters have like no problematic relationship. If that's your relationship with your mom, like that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I just think it's such a deep, complex thing. And I, and I also, so I started writing about it. My, my mom passed away um, about in 2008. So um, I started writing the book kind of thinking about being a daughter to a mom and like having that connection gone and like how do you how do you get through how do you manage loss like a lost connection like that um and I you know I wanted to write it I wanted to write it not just about death but like about the different ways that we lose people in our lives not just through death but just like by not like connecting exactly the way we want to, by like missing each other in these ways, or even, you know, um, becoming different people over time. Um, so that's kind of where it started for me was like just thinking about like my own mother and my own relationship with her, and and not that B and Agnes have that share that with. That's not my relationship with my mom, but it's it's the kind of like relationship that's full of love but also has all of this other stuff in it um that's really hard to to describe um and then part way through writing the book I had a daughter so then I started to think about being a mom to a daughter and then it just got even more complex um but I wanted I'm really invested in like letting mothers be complicated on the page I find it very helpful <laughs> to read complicated mothers, com mothers who are full of love, but also full of love for themselves too. And like have a real tension between what to do, what to give up for their children and what to keep for themselves. Um, I just find that, I think that's so important uh, to, to talk about and to see represented and that's partly where like B comes from. It's just like asking myself or asking the character, well, of course you're gonna, you're gonna do whatever it takes to save your child, but do you have to be happy about it? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like what's, what is real? What would be a real honest response? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I but felt, I, go ahead, Lainey, you go. I was just gonna say to bounce off Chris and, and that relationship when I, I think Lord of the Flies is a good lens to view it, but also I thought of the road and like these connections with people, especially in a world where there's not a lot of connection. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I think of like throughout the book there, I won't give it away, but objects people kind of bring with them and like some of them become really important to them. And all I could think of is what would I bring if I could bring like one thing with me, uh, not that you have to have an answer to put you on the spot, but I just think that that was a really cool thing to think about. Like what, what would define you or like what's your biggest accomplishment? And so that was a really fun thing to, did you think about that when you were writing? I don't know that I thought about it. I mean, at some point, actually like, the, the fact that the, there's this cast iron pot that they keep bringing everywhere, which is a ridiculous thing because it's so heavy, but, and they're just, all they do is walk every day and carry everything they belong. Um, but that felt, it's not, it's not my cast iron pot. It's not the thing that I would bring, but that made sense to me in that it like, I would probably bring some totally vintage relic that was super useful um i don't know i still have like my stuffed animals from when i was a kid 
And I feel like put in this position, like it's very possible I would bring something as useless as one of my stuffed animals. Sem sentimental. Yeah, sentimental, I think. There's like, yeah. you can either go useful or you can go totally sentimental. But either way, it should be light. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Not the cast um, iron. Not cast iron. Yeah, so great. Um, we have some people who have written in questions, so want to get to some of those. Um, Jennifer Winbury, uh, our friend in New Jersey, she says, uh, book list said the new wilderness uh, from a wider angle exposes malignant greed, deceit, and injustice, which to me feels so true of 2020. What is it like to write a post-apocalyptic dystopian novel and then to live through the year 2020? so far. And would you move to the wilderness state right now if you could? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, oh my God, you know, I feel like I wanna say yes, but I also know how hard it would be. So this is, goes back to your question, Chris, just about like, you know, my first, my first like heart leap response to that was like, yes, <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. I live in like an 800 square foot Brooklyn apartment with two children under three. So it's like, yes, I would definitely go. Um, <clears throat> that sounds wonderful, but no, because it's really hard and probably one of us would die. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's a real thing. So it's like gets to that like romanticizing idea it's like I would move to the wilderness state if there were a cabin for me to live in <laughs> and food <laughs> because all I want to do is kind of disappear from this our current situation um but no I don't think I would because I because we're safe right now like my family like we're just we're like this tiny little bubble and we're safe and the world around us is pretty terrible and a lot of people aren't safe right now, um, but we are. So I feel like I can't give that up for like the risk of the wilderness state. That's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, guys, do you have other questions from our friends? Yeah, I do. And this is when I was curious myself when I was reading the book. Um, this is from Janet Lockhart. Uh, let's see, I want to Let's see if I can find it here. Oh, yeah. So she was curious about the research that went into writing the New Wilderness, specifically some of the hunting methods and the food preparation. Uh, and she says, I know I wouldn't last long trying to live off the land. Right. Yeah. No, it's really hard. Um, and the way that they're forced to do it is even like totally um, a perversion of what they would be like if they were a, like a primitive group you know like they would they're the rules that are imposed on the community in the wilderness state are just above and beyond anything that someone would experience so it's like definitely this pressure um well research was fun um a lot of people online love to instruct on primitive wilderness skills there's just like a lot of information <laughs> people love i mean like when whether that's like um like a native population, like preserving what they've used for centuries, or it's like some new survivalist dude, you know, on YouTube who's like really into, you know, making pelts. You know, it's just like, there's like a whole strange range. It's a very complicated space, online space. Um, but I did like some research. I. I looked into like brain tanning and like trying to figure out the bare minimum of what they would need. And then at some point, um, I did have to say to myself, you're writing fiction and it doesn't, ha it's not historical fiction, it's speculative and totally imagined. And if I was starting to research myself into a corner, that was too complicated for me like that then started to make me feel like i was losing um the credibility of the world like i was like you can i think you can research yourself into a 
into a corner where you suddenly start to question whether you can pull it off, like the book or the world that you're building or the situation that you're trying to create. So at some point I would just back off and say, this is fiction, I can do whatever I want. They can have acorn cakes if they wanna have acorn cakes. Would they have acorn cakes? Probably not, but I don't care. I'm just gonna write it. <laughs> so a lot of research just to like make it seem like it's really possible and that there's like they are actually surviving they're using sinew thread and they're like eating the what they kill and they're making arrows and they're smoking their meat they're not gonna get sick like they're doing everything they need to do to do it right but i was i stopped worrying about getting it perfect on the page and just let hoped that my reader would say okay they, they know what they're doing <laughs> you know I actually really enjoy that everybody's not all of an expert in everything because then it kind of gives them to have some comments on the way other people are doing some things. Um, so I have a question from Casey Davis, our, friend, our librarian friend in Connecticut. So with the recent popularity of eco dystopian novels such as the Southern Reach Trilogy or After the Flood by Cassandra Montag, what made you decide specifically for that subject in your latest novel to go into that world? Um, I think I kind of like stepped sideways into it. It wasn't like, I, I want to write a book about this. Um, but that it was, I was kind of just following up on the, the stories that I wrote for my first collection, which a lot of them, um, a lot of them have to do with that spectrum I mentioned of, of humanness to animalness. Um, and so putting people into a wilderness situation, like people who are just very modern future people, like people like me, and suddenly making them need to connect with a, a deeper instinctual self was like the project. And that put us into a wilderness place. And I think a lot about land deregulation. <laughs> That's maybe my dystopian future fear is like, I just see, I don't know, I, I think without getting too political, like lots of little fires get set and everybody gets distracted by, like no one knows we're all trying to put out some fires and then other ones are burning and 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 keep burning and we just we can't set we can't put them all out um, and i think land deregulation and like the gutting of the epa and environmental regulation is just something that's like one of the fires that we can't quite put out because there's just too much else going on and that worries me and it's something i think about a lot um and that's i think where the the more political aspect of the book comes out in the more like dystopian future read. Um, I was talking with someone just about like, how it ends up, like how the, how we get to a future where all of these things have gone wrong. Um, like what had to happen in order for, for us to reach that dire place. And I guess my, my that's just where i see us going <laughs> i mean unchecked you know i mean i might be a little pessimistic i might be a lot pessimistic actually but uh i think the things that are happening currently are setting us on a bad course and i think the environment the environmental issues touch everything else i mean this isn't this isn't something new that i'm saying but uh, I think it will affect everyone in ways that, and I think, especially now with the pandemic, we're seeing how much we're all affected by something, like how we can all be affected in the world by this one thing. And I think that is a vision to come for when environmental catastrophes become very real to everybody. Sorry to bring it down. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, you know, 
it is, we talked about this yesterday when we were, you know, we touched on this about how strange this is that uh, we're living in this time and your book and Jonathan's book were written long before this was an, an issue. And so uh, quite telling, but also, um, I don't know, it's, uh, it is, it is here. And, um, you know, I, I, um, we have more questions. I love that we have more questions. I don't love that we have more questions than time. So I'm thinking what we'll do because we need to bring Jonathan on. Um, I think what we'll do uh, is take everyone whose question hasn't been answered and we'll email it to you. And then if you wouldn't mind, if you could send an email back to them because you, Diane, are not on Facebook. So if, if that's okay with you, I think, because I would love, there's some great questions and I would, I would love to connect you with our librarians and, and uh, your answers are so thoughtful and this last one is so powerful and true. Um, and um, would, I'd love to con continue the conversation. Yeah, that would be great. I would love that. Thank you. Thank you. Because yeah, there's also a great question about um, about your uh, your writing classes, and there's just so much. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna circle back on that, and we'll we'll even post the answers on Facebook. How's that? Perfect. Yeah. So um, again, the new wilderness. It goes on sale a week from today. It is so powerful, um, and it it is haunting it is you cannot stop uh turning these pages to find out what happens next this this band of people that just keeps moving and how they discover a whole new world and that's what you'll discover when you read it so congratulations again diane and uh we're gonna put you in the virtual green room to eat virtual cookies okay great <laughs> and thank you <laughs> see you in a little bit thanks okay Ah, oh, book. I Amazing. Know. So much to talk about. I know. I know. So don't worry, everybody who sent in a question before or today, we're going to get to them. She's going to answer them and we'll post them on Facebook for everybody else to see them. So, um, but now let us, let us bring on Mr. Jonathan Latham. Okay. Doing that now. I wonder what he's been doing. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. How was your your visit? It was lovely. Yeah. Well, I've I've been thinking of, over all of my misdeeds while I was in my holding area, and I'm very sorry for everything. And I hope you'll have me back. <laughs> no. You can come back anytime. I, I just want to say timeouts are very effective. Okay. So don't do it again. Mm. The virtual chips were stale back there in the green room, I guess. Oh, no, the cookies say. were fantastic. <laughs> That's why I wanted to get on your good side now, because the spread, the virtual spread was really lavish. You guys went all out. Oh, yeah, yeah, we went with a good Gouda. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, Christopher, I turn this to you now, and we will talk to Mr. Latham about his book. Okay, so I don't know if Jonathan needs an introduction, but I'm going to give one because... He's Jonathan Lethem. He's the best-selling author of The Feral Detective, Motherless Brooklyn, uh, and now your new novel, The Arrest, which is a, dare I say, madcap dystopian novel, but not so dystopian. It's just like this entirely fresh take on what happens when the world stops working in the way we expect it to. I don't want to give away too much because I do want to give you the floor, Jonathan, but I, I do just want to say again how much I adored this book. It's pacey and hilarious and I just love the language I love your language so it's uh it's an honor to have you on the program thanks for joining thanks us. so much it's really fun to talk with you guys and um um yeah and good company and um and all company is good these days right <laughs> um so um I yeah I don't want to give away too much either but I, I I thought I could talk a little bit more about the book in a couple of ways that I hope will be tantalizing and not spoilers and um um you probably noticed just now on the uh, on the cover of the uh, the book. There's this bucolic coastal town, um, and, um, and oh, there it is again. And then there's this weird thing in the middle of it. There's this um, giant uh, 
aluminum plated uh, uh, science fiction-y kind of object. Um, and um, this is, you know, um, in the book it's called, um, it's given a couple of names. It's called the supercar. People call it a supercar. And um, the guy who drives it, who owns it, has a nickname for it or, a, you know, an official name for it. He calls it the blue streak. Um, so this is a story about a very quiet place where a very loud thing comes in and, and causes problems. Um, it is set in an extremely near future. In fact, it's kind of set in, in exactly where we are right now, except things are a little weird, a little different. And um, uh, something that gives the title of the book, The Arrest Has Happened, where um, many kinds of machines have stopped working. And uh, those include our, the kinds of machines we're using right now to have this conversation. So the computers have all gone away and your phones have all died and gasoline has stopped working. There are no cars except the supercar and guns won't work anymore. Uh, you know, Chris, I heard you hesitating when you said it's dystopian, but not so much. I think that that's, that hesitation is really appropriate. There's something of a kind of a little bit of a wish fulfillment uh, element to this book. It's, it's, a, it's a version of a kind of collapse, but a very gentle collapse. And a lot of us who are at least, at the very least ambivalent about things like cell phones and, um, and, and Zoom calls, this one notwithstanding, um, and people like me who are not ambivalent, but quite anxious, made quite anxious by things like uh, gasoline engines and, and, and guns, um, could maybe see that what happened in the arrest is not dystopian at all, but a kind of uh, dream come true. Anyway, it's certainly not simply bad or good. It's just very, very different. And the, the big result in the book is that things have gotten very quiet. Well, this, this may remind us in some ways of the situation that the pandemic has created. Of course, the book was written before the pandemic. Um, things have gotten very quiet and they've gotten very local because if you're in the arrest, not only are you like we are now in the pandemic, you sort of are only living where you are, but you're also not doing what we're doing right now. You're not having remote communications and working from home because everything else doesn't kind of work either. So it's, it's a very local, very relaxed kind of uh, catastrophe. Um, and one in which the, at the, as the book begins, the top, uh, the top dogs, the people who run society are pretty much the organic farmers. Um, so, you know, again, you can see this as a kind of wish fulfillment, like, you know, what if the organic farmers were in charge? <laughs> How would that work out? Let's try that one. So it's a thought experiment. But into this quiet, very, very quiet catastrophe, but catastrophe of mine comes this inexplicable object. It shouldn't work anymore because it's a machine, but it does work. And the guy who is driving it and drives it into their town is, uh, he's kind of a throwback. He's like a uh, a, a bad man of, of the old school. Um, you know, he, he has reminded some of my early readers of a kind of catastrophic combination of um, Harvey Weinstein and, uh, and our, our, our current leader, who is definitely not an organic farmer. And, um, and but he's also just a, a kind of a, a, a blowhard. He's someone who talks a lot and lies a lot and makes a lot of crazy promises and makes a lot of crazy schemes. And some people find him kind of fascinating or charming. Uh, there's something at least, um, let's say, enthralling about this guy. You can get kind of hypnotized. So he comes, he blows into town in this supercar. And this is maybe, um, Lainey, do you wanna show a couple of pictures? One of the things that happens at the beginning of the book, oh, there's, there's an image. So the, the main character of the story or the narrator of the story, the, the, the point of view character is a, a, a sort of hapless guy who has nicknamed himself Journeyman. And when Journeyman sees the supercar, his mind is blown. And he, the first thing he does is he, he tries to find some illustrations to show to the reader because he doesn't have any way of describing it. And so the book actually has a couple of images in it because it's a sort of words fail situation and, and Journeyman wants you to be able to visualize the supercar. So the first image he finds is this very strange picture from a, 
um, well, I found it in the Library of Congress collection. It's actually some kind of um, physics experiment um, on wheels. I don't know why it needed to be on wheels. Maybe it had to be in motion to do what it was going to do. And so this is the first visual point of reference for the supercar that um, journeymen can locate and offer to the reader. And then there's this uh, comic book drawing that he finds, which is the second. And this is drawn by my one of my childhood heroes, Jack Kirby. And it's, although Superman doesn't appear in this image, it's actually from a Superman comic. And if you look at the top, the guy who's talking at the top of the page uh, is Jimmy Olsen. Um, but so here's another image of, of um, something that might remind you of the supercar because uh, it's something that is so impossible to describe that you need illustrations. So um, I think that's probably enough of a basic description to set it up. And then the only other thing I'll do before I, I take some questions and I'm very eager for your questions and just for some conversation with um, my invisible friends out there, I know you're there. Um, is to um, read a tiny little bit from the book. And the reason I wanted to read, um, and the, the reason I picked the reading I did, is that there's a very important library in, in, the, in the story. So this book is set in a small town where, as I said, the, the quiet catastrophe has kind of calmed everything down. And it's a town where in past days, it's a coastal uh, town in, in rural Maine, um, loosely based on places in Maine that I spend a lot of time in and, and love very much. And in this town, there's a very central library that everyone loves. And, you know, one of the things that continues to function quite beautifully after the arrest um, is the library. It's still there and the books are still there, you know, and you don't need gasoline to operate a library and you don't need, um, you don't need guns and you don't need, uh, uh, electronics, you can go in the daytime when there's sunlight sh shining through the windows and you can pick out a book and, and read a book. So the library is, is like holding strong. It's really still doing fine. But one of the other things that happens in, in this catastrophe is that sometimes people show up from elsewhere and they just take over things. And um, very perplexingly um, on, uh, on page 117, uh, the main character goes and, and he discovers that there's a woman who's moved into the library. There's the title of the chapter, the woman who lived in the library. And so he's a little bit perplexed. He's interested. He's curious about who she is and where she came from. But he also really wanted to go in and get some books. And instead, she's sort of answering the door as if it's her home now. So here's just a little bit from this puzzling encounter with a woman who moved into the library. Uh, journeyman cherished visiting the library. His first thought was that this roving woman shouldn't screw up such an essential part of the post-arrest commons. She would barred the door from within, so journeyman had to pound on it and call out and wait. Yet when she opened the door, it was without demanding he identify himself. She seemed more irked than afraid. Yes, she said. I have food for you, said journeyman. One of his jobs is that he delivers baskets of food uh, to, to various people living in the town. So he's decided a good way to welcome the woman who's moved into the library is to bring her some food. I have food for you, said Journeyman. Who sent you, she said. No one, said Journeyman. It's just what we do. Okay, she said. Thank you. I'm Alexander Duplessis. That's his real name. Okay, said the woman who moved into the library. That's good to know. We, uh, a lot of people like to come in here and get books, he said. Is there a particular book you want today? She asked him. Are you a librarian? He almost said. Instead, he said, sometimes I don't know what I'm looking for until I find it. Well, that's a luxurious attitude these days, she said. Well, you've come to a place, he began, I don't know if I'd call it luxury exactly, but we do find time for certain pleasures like reading, looking at the books in the library. It's a lucky place, she said. Do you even know how lucky you are? No, he said, I'm sure I don't. You shouldn't leave a place like this unguarded, said the woman who'd moved into the library. I'll stop there. So that's a little glimpse of how the library functions in 
in this story and and um, to to learn out to learn find out more about how uh, journeyman and this woman get along in the future of the book, you'll have to you have to read it. So um, again, thank you, uh, team for uh, Virginia and and Lainey and Chris for pulling me in here. And um, now I'm just really excited to hear from um, you you guys uh, with any questions about. Um, Sure. This, this book or, or past books or whatever else you think I can help with. Okay, first of all, and thank you again. That was, and thank you for reading that. Uh, we're we're going to have Diane back and she's, she's going to read a little, just a little bit from her book as well. But um, uh, I'll start and then we can go around. Okay, you guys. Um, uh, Maureen Roberts from Baltimore says, when you first started writing, did you purposefully intend to be a genre bender? Uh -huh. Are there any? Are there any genres of fiction which you avoid reading? That's a great question. You know, I, as embarrassing it is, as it is to admit this, and although the term genre bender didn't exist yet, I, so I couldn't have had that wish to be called a genre bender, I really did, in a lot of ways, have this very deliberate project when I started out. I thought, I want to be one of those people like I like as a reader who are spoken of as being part of a genre and, and, and really committed to it, but also people will always say about them, but you've got to read them whether you like that genre or not, because they're doing m many other things too. And when I say that, it's easiest to describe it in terms of examples. The writers I was in love with when I was a teenager and I was starting to think I wanted to become a writer were people like Shirley Jackson, who was always spoken of as a horror writer and a literary writer, much more than a horror writer. I thought, that's great. I like, it's something about that always captured my imagination. And I loved Raymond Chandler, who was every, you know, literary reader's favorite crime writer, it seemed, and also Patricia Highsmith, who had that same status. And, and then I got very deeply into science fiction. Um, that was mostly thanks to my mother's bookshelves because she had a lot of really great paperback science fiction there. And I began where a lot of people begin as readers with you know, Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles, which I'm very happy to report my 10 year old <laughs> just finished reading. And um, Isaac Asimov's uh, Robot Stories, I, Robot, and, and then Caves of Steel. And, um, and then I, I discovered, uh, shortly after that, I discovered s some writers that became really formative influences for me. And they were the, the, the writers who were in some ways in fashion in science fiction when I was, at that time, when I was a, a, a teenage reader, and that's to say in the early 70s. It was uh, Samuel Delaney and Ursula Le Guin and J.G. Ballard and Philip K. Dick and a few others, Thomas Dish who's less, less remembered, but is another remarkable writer. And it was true of all of that group of science fiction writers that they themselves had conceived that what they were doing was also literary, that they had aspirations to write novels that were great novels, whether you liked science fiction or not. And I think that all of those writers did achieve that. And this galvanized me. I wanted to be that kind of writer. So yes, I was really thinking, let me see if I can do more than one thing at a time. And that became then an interest in doing more than one genre at a time. So then, you know, my first novel was in a way, a very deliberate attempt to put Raymond Chandler and Philip K. Dick together. And it was called Gun With Occasional Music. And was that the one that you uh, wanted control over the art direction of the jacket? Yes. And there's a funny story about that, um, that the first edition of my first novel. So, um, I was, I was really granted the chance to art direct the, or I guess that's the term, or anyway, to design the, the cover, not to paint it myself, but to um, describe what, what I wanted and, and have an artist execute it. And at that time, my idea about that book was that it was a, a kind of um, a retro object. It should be like a used book, not a new book, because it was based on pulp fiction. It was based on old Raymond Chandler paperbacks and old Philip K. Dick novels. And I wanted, even though it was a hardcover, it was being published by my first publisher, Harcourt Brace. Uh, at that time it was called Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. I'm sure all of you remember that 
lost name. And, um, uh, and I, I, so I art directed it. I said, it should look like a battered old paperback. And they took me at my word. And the person who designed the book quite brilliantly did what a painter calls Trump Loy wear and tear on the jacket. So they painted all these little fissures and cracks and bends and distortions. So it looked like it had been tossed around and battered and it had come out of a used bookstore. And when they shipped, when Harcourt Brace shipped the first edition, there were a number of bookstores that immediately shipped the box right back to the warehouse and said, we got a damaged <laughs> shipment. Please try again. <laughs> This is a funny story. Uh, I'll just interject for one second and then turn it to Chris and Laney, but that um, that story is in Nancy Pearl's book, The Writer's Library, which we're publishing and it comes out in uh, September. And Jonathan is one of the people, who, one of the writers who is uh, is interviewed by Nancy and Jeff Schwager. And the, the point of that book is, you just bring me right back to it because it's all about the books that informed you and shaped you and you know, what, what what informed you as a writer and you know in your life and so it's very interesting because you're at the end of the chapter all these books that are you know on your bookshelves are just a sampling of and they're all over the place and it's really cool but i don't want to i don't want to digress but it's it's very interesting that you're just it, going it was a really fun conversation with those two and i i mean it was one of the one of the great interviews i've ever given because they were just so interested in the the my life with books which, you know, it's more interesting to talk about other people's books than my own sometimes. And I just had such a good time with them. And now I can't wait to see the book because I haven't seen anything. I, all I know is my own interview, but I want to see if they had that same kind of talk with these other writers. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And there's some some thread between a lot of you. I mean, I, when I was reading about yours, I was reading, I was thinking about um, Madeline Miller because um, you were reading way beyond your age range when you were a kid. I mean, you really were a voracious reader, not, you know, I mean, I thought, and it was like, she's 10 years old reading this, this stuff is amazing. Anyway, well, it's all in the book there. That's in Nancy's book, The Writer's Library. It was very Thanks. interesting and you're not alone. All right, Chris Laney, I'll, I'll stop, let you guys go, you got questions. Sure, um, well, I have a friend, uh, question from our friend, uh, Lily and Dabney in Seattle. And I just wanna preface this because you have this great behind the book essay it's up on Edelweiss librarians if you want to go read it about speculative fiction and you brought up George Orwell in 1984 and how he essentially rearranged 1948 and right. kind of like what what speculative fiction or alternative realities are doing so Lillian asked you have written several novels exploring an alternative reality when and how did your interest in the exploration of these worlds begin if you could talk maybe about the process of writing these worlds Great. Well, I mean, I, I, so I talked about some of my early reading influences just now, you know, the way I fell in love with Ray Bradbury and Asimov and then uh, Le Guin and, and Philip K. Dick and, and others, Delaney and others. Um, I also was very receptive to, um, you know, uh, visionary uh, stories in other mediums. I loved uh, watching old reruns of the Twilight Zone on television when I was a kid. They freaked me out and I really was excited about them. And I got into comic books and I would read Marvel comic books and especially the Marvel comic books of the early 1970s when I was a kid going to the like candy store, they were really weird. Partly because Marvel had been around a little while and they were beginning to um, you know, try to uh, live up to their reputation for being the, the hip, you know, strange, ambitious, visionary comics company. And so they were letting their writers do anything they liked. And a lot of these writers were young, well, sometimes science fiction writers or just young comics writers who were frankly, you know, hippies too. They were taking a lot of drugs. And those, those Marvel comics of that period were really, really uh, wild. And at the same time, I think I was responsive to a lot of this kind of uh, storytelling because I found the world to be really bewildering. I grew up at a time, you know, now I guess my children are, are doing the same thing, of incredible revolutionary unrest and transformative political, um, 
you know, uh, movements and also devastating uh, political nightmares. The Vietnam War and um, and and the Watergate era and the the wake, the unfit, what we now understand is the unfinished wake of the civil rights era. And I also was in New York City, which was in free fall. The early seventies, that city went bankrupt. And um, I lived in a part of Brooklyn that was uh, redlined by the banks and was almost, it was a kind of dystopian city in, in interesting ways, as well as scary ones. It was uh, very, you know, there were a lot of juxtapositions of class and culture and, and race and a lot of freedom, a lot of possibilities. You know, artists would buy abandoned buildings and transform them in a way that made you feel that, you know, anything was possible. But it was also a very hard time and there was a lot of pain. And so when I would read science fiction, especially dystopian science fiction, I would have a sense of recognition. And it wasn't, oh, maybe the world will be this way someday. <laughs> It was often, oh, this is helping me think about what I see right in front of me. This is kind of what, what we have. It's translated into metaphors or exaggerated slightly, but these are descriptions of the world as I recognize it. You know, um, right now, uh, so I, I teach Pomona, at Pomona College and right now we're having, we have a wonderful program where the uh, incoming uh, first years all read the same book. And I'm on the committee that helps pick the book uh, year after year to, to, to read. And seven, eight months ago, we landed on the selection of Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. Not knowing, <laughs> needless to say, that we would be in this pandemic. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a book that was written uh, more than I think 20 years ago, uh, substantially more than 20 years ago, but it's, it's of this moment. That doesn't mean that she was simply looking through a time tunnel and seeing what 2020 would be like. The reason Octavia Butler was able to write a book that feels so relevant now is that she was looking around at her world and seeing the seeds of this moment. She was seeing elements of the time when she was writing and extrapolating them responding to them, living with them. And then what she put on the page was a report that remains fresh and relevant. Yeah, it's crazy how things endure, you know, the physical building blocks of the human experience. They're always going to be there. That's really great. Yeah. Um, I think overwhelmingly, we've had a lot of questions about your bookshelves. Everyone wants to know what writings informed your work what's your favorite you know book from the past but Lillian Dabney also asked what you're reading right now what you're excited about uh well it's a, a great question I'm very caught up in um, manuscripts right now I, you know one of the things that happens when you if you're um, a, a writer who is collegial and knows a lot of other writers um and then you also teach creative writing so you have these brilliant students who uh it seems like 20 of my, my, my most um, energetic and, and, um, and ambitious students have taken the opportunity of their quarantine to suddenly write substantial novels. So I'm doing a lot of reading of unpublished work. Sometimes it's galleys by friends or, or manuscripts by friends that I can say for sure you guys will be seeing before long. And other times it's novels by these younger writers who I work with, who are doing extraordinary things too, and are um, and and are hoping to publish, and someday I'm sure I'm sure they will. So um, it, it just happens that my present reading is almost uh, exclusively um, printouts, pages, manuscripts. I just read, um, for instance, uh, Dana Spiota's next novel, and I'm forgetting the title right. I don't have it in front of me. I'm forgetting the title right offhand, um, at which is. Fantastic, really great new book from her. She's someone who uh, uh, I, I, I'm always so eager to read. And this time I got to, I got to get the sneak preview. Um, I tried to offer her some comments, but mostly I just gave her like a giant thumbs up. I thought, it's perfect, it's great, just publish it. Um, 
and um, and right at the moment, I'm I'm embarking on a novel by um, actually uh, my my student Julius, who was the first uh, Pomona student I got to know 10, 10 years ago. Because when I came here on my job interview, they had uh, they asked for a student to volunteer to walk me around campus and. Julius was one of the two guys who gave me a tour, and, and and of course I'm sure he was part of my interview too. They probably, you know, the minute the minute he was done, he, they were like, "So what do you think of him?" So Julius was the student who gave me my tour, and then I I I got the job, and then he signed up for my first writing class, and now he's finished a novel. So this is one of the things, one of the rewards you can have for, um, you know, sticking around for a while instead of to see. This I was thinking uh, reading um, about your um, your book collecting, amassing, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, uh, that uh, you, um, I thought, wow, that would be a really cool Instagram takeover. We have a we have an author wow. Instagram takeover that Laney oversees, and on Fridays we have. Yeah, maybe I should do that. You should because it sounds like a museum. Yeah, and it sounds amazing do you want to see a couple of artifacts i can i know where where things i could do with like a very quick show and tell right now why not two things why not just Let's do it a preview for more to come while we're waiting we're it's a good intro to show who's going to be this week's Instagram oh project. look at you so thank you um this week we have paul tremblay Survivor oh, song. Nice. So, Harper Library, be sure to log on on this Friday and see a takeover from Paul. That's pretty cool. Leave it up there, Lainey, so uh, Jonathan can see it. And then he'll be like, he'll want to want to do it too. <laughs> yeah. Again, Harper Library on Instagram. You can follow us and always see our Friday takeovers. It's been really fun. I think everyone brings their own flavor to it. No one is, you know, no cookie cutter. Everybody brings their own stuff. And I think it's, Really cool. You see writing spaces, books that they're reading. You had Meg Cavett last Friday, right, Lainey? So fun. You have to go watch her writing desk take over because I'm not even going to give it away. It's hilarious. You yeah. have to go watch. So Jonathan, if you look at your screen, this is what it will look like, except it'll be your face and your book, and you can take uh, viewers through to your writing space. All right. Maybe we can try to do that. Uh, right oh. now, of course, my writing space is my kitchen table. Well, you can, if, listen, there are no rules. Listen, yeah. we're doing whatever we want. So you can show us whatever you, Nancy did it. Nancy Pearl did it. And she like had herself in a little, her little personal library nook. And she went around showing everybody how she uh, alphabetized all of her books. It's hilarious. Well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, maybe I'll bust into my campus office, which is a fun space. Uh, right now I'm staying home most of the time, but it's quiet over there. It's not like it's dangerous. So I'll just go and give okay. you a tour of that space. So um, but I do have a few things here. And then we'll, um, we'll bring Miss Diane Cook back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me show you a couple of books real fast. So yeah. one of the things I, now I know librarians can be very ambivalent about autographed books because if the author autographs the book, then someone will steal it from the library, I've been told. So I've actually often had librarians say, no, don't, don't, don't sign it. Don't do that. But I do treasure autographs and I, you know, it's a social, it's, it's one of the things that in my life as a writer, I've gotten to meet people and I just always want to try to, if I can, remember to bring along a book of theirs and, and, and get an autograph because it just becomes such a talismanic object. So um, this one is a, is a, a, a inscription that always makes me laugh that I really love. So this is a uh, first edition of Vivian Gornick's The Romance of American Communism. It's a wow. book that is, very important to me while I was writing this uh, novel called Dissident Gardens, which was my attempt to write about the American communist movement, among other things. Um, also just to write about, you know, another book about growing up in New York City and what it was like to be from the outer boroughs. It's a book about Queens, communists in Queens. So I handed it to Vivian, who, who's a very, uh, very funny, uh, sardonic character. And she looked at me, she kind of arched her eyebrow at me. She was like, Jonathan, why are you reading that? <laughs> this, and this was at a point where this, this book was totally out of print. And, um, and she started regaling me with stories of how it had been badly reviewed and how much pain it had caused her and how uncomfortable she was when she thought about it and how 
many regrets she had because it was just it just opened up this vein and so then she inscribed it to me and, it, and I kept insisting how good it was and how it was my crucial research object and she, she, she wrote for Jonathan hope this does you more good than it did me Love it. <laughs> Um, now, of course, subsequently, the book has been embraced. It's been republished. It's uh, something that lots of people are reading because we have a new, you know, notion of a socialist possibility in, in the United States. So she was ahead of, she was too far ahead of her time. Um, this is, an, I'll show you one more. So this okay. is, um, I like this because it's a kind of part of a daisy chain of, so Bud Schulberg, some people remember his name, some people don't. He was a a journalist and a screenwriter and a novelist. And he, his, his probably his greatest, most lasting contribution is he wrote the screenplay for On the Waterfront. But The Disenchanted is a novel he wrote that's a Roman a clef about when he was a very young man, um, how he was assigned the job of um, working on a screenplay with an aging alcoholic writer named F. Scott Fitzgerald and how they got sent on an assignment together to go research something for a screenplay and Fitzgerald ended up on this horrible bender and, and Schulberg as a very young man had to basically take care of him and babysit F. Scott That's Fitzgerald. Funny. So, so I, I, I met Schulberg and I had him sign it for me. And I just think, you know, this, so this is his novel about being with Fitzgerald. It's like a, it's like a daisy chain. It puts me one remove Absolutely. Gerald in that story. So, That's pretty cool. I like books as, as talismanic objects. Um, you know, there are books in this house that I bought as a teenager uh, in, it, when I was living in New York City, moved to the West Coast when I first left the East and lived in Berkeley in my 20s. I moved them back to New York when I was living in Brooklyn again, writing Fortress of Solitude and Motherless Brooklyn in my 30s. And now they've been, they've, come to California a second time with me. So they've, they've done uh, coast to coast twice as, as, as objects in my, in my care. Well, that's lovely. That's wonderful. They'll always be with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, listen, this has been so wonderful. Uh, again, your book's out not, uh, you know, in a few months, November will be here before we know it, but we certainly want to let librarians they know about it, but this is just some icing on the cake. And uh, it's been great to hear you talk about uh, the arrest and um, and to read from it. And thank you for that very special reading. So um, why don't we bring Diane back? Great. And um, we will, hello. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Did you enjoy the virtual cookies in the virtual room? I did very much, and I I was able to watch Jonathan. That was wonderful. Oh, okay. cool! And I think I would much rather be in your world of the arrests than in my world of the wilderness. <laughs> if I had a choice, yeah. it's just it sounds really nice. <laughs> you know, every every day that passes, I think the arrest is more and more a, a possibly a, a utopian book rather than a dystopian. <laughs> yeah. Um. We. Uh. You know. Diane, we had talked about um, your reading uh, section and we still, we still have some time and there are folks that are listening. So, and Jonathan read his piece and it would be lovely if, if you would read yours. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, so um, I'll just read a little, like a couple paragraphs. Since Jonathan, since you read a part about a librarian, I'll just read a part um, that references books. <laughs> It's one of the things that they carry with them on their forever walking. So this is a little <laughs> section in the beginning where um, they're about to uh, try and cross this river that they've crossed many, many times before, but a storm has come through and it's like a suddenly a really wild, crazy river. So they're, they've gotten to the river and they're about to approach it and see how to cross it. They lowered themselves and then the children down a small ledge to the almost non-existent bank where greens grew, a color found almost exclusively next to rivers. The grasses, mosses, the striving trees, so thin they could be snapped between two fingers, their new spring leaves, quivers of creamy green. They handed down their bedding rolls, the pouches of smoked meat, jerky, pemmican, and harvested pine nuts, precious acorns, wild rice, icorn, 
a handful of wild onions, the disassembled smoking tent, their personal satchels, the hunting bows and arrows, the bag of hollowed wooden meal bowls, and the chips of wood and stone they used as utensils, the precious box of precious knives, the book bag, the cast iron, the manual, and the bags of their garbage they carried with them to be weighed and disposed of by the rangers at post. In the water, a loose log stripped naked of its bark and limbs bobbed and rolled past even the nearby landscape, even though the nearby landscape was treeless. The log must have traveled from the foothills, the unusual torrent of water ushering it through. On a lazier river or even a lazier part of this river, a log would have gathered farther upstream, upstream in an eddy or been nudged onto a bank. But here it rolled in the rapids, rapids they'd never even noticed in previous crossings when the water was low and any white water was just a skimming thin hat that the river rocks wore. They watched another log vault head over tail, after which Caroline took her first tentative step out into the water. That's all I'll read. So they have a book bag. <laughs> they carry it everywhere. <laughs> and a cast iron skillet. <laughs> and I love the origin story of a cast iron skillet as well. Yeah, um, yeah these are two fantastic books. Like I. It was it was a little strange reading them back to back. It was I'm just not used to that amount of affection for two books back to back. Like I, I thought I didn't have it in me to love two books that much back to back, but I did. So here we are, and I really want to thank you both for joining us. It was really incredible. It's very both of you talk about your books. Um, anything else we want to say, Lainey, Virginia, Jonathan? I Diane? just want to <laughs> echo what Chris said. Uh, that um, that the, these are just wonderful reads, and they they you know they just literally sweep you away. Uh, well, in, especially in that excerpt, dang it. Um, <laughs> oh, so good. Um, no, so exciting, and um, just so just just so wonderful to have you both on and to to share uh, these creations with uh, with us in the larger world, which is the world of librarians who are in their own sort of strange place. You know, some of them are still closed and some of them are uh, the doors squeaking open a little bit and patrons are picking up books curbside. Librarians are bringing books out and delivering them into trunks. It depends on where they live and it depends on a lot of things. But, um, uh, you know, we, we've all adapted. Uh, librarians uh, were the best at it, I think, and the first to do it. Um, and uh, because um, they just want to get good books into the hands of their patrons. And so we thank you so much uh, for, for, for offering these wonderful reads and for offering your time. And we congratulate you both. Um, Diane, next week, happy book birthday. Thank you. I'm excited oh. for it to be out finally. I know, I know. And Great. Lainey, do you have anything you want to say before we say goodbye? I think you both said it so eloquently. I'll leave it to that, but thank you both for coming. It was a joy to have you and to hear from you. Thanks so much. Much. We'll give you both the last word. Jonathan, Diane, anything that you want to say to librarians, take it away and then we'll say goodbye. I'm just always so so in awe of, of what you do and 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 the the continuity that libraries represent in communities and and in my own life, you know, I, I, I'll never forget the day I walked out of the Pacific branch of the Brooklyn Public Library with my first stack, my first stack and my first library card. Um, so thank you. And thank you. I, librarians are the best readers. Um, and I'm, I apologize that I've racked up fines in the past. <laughs> But it's just like that, that's why we had to go into the the timeout room. We were thinking about the font, the late, the overdue books. Yeah. Well, start writing your checks. <laughs> I'm all paid up. Okay, good for you. Well, again, our best to you both, and thank you again, and friends for watching. Thank you so much. Take good care. Stay safe, and thank we'll you. see you next week. Take good care, all. Bye bye. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Diane. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.